No, for, according to Epicurus, gods exist, but they are in the interspace of the world, no? Like, out. And I think this is how this one functions. It is uh, integrated into academic machinery, but a place apart, not part of the usual machinery. And I think this position is excellent. It, it does get, on the one hand, top people, people who are, and this is one of the main reasons that I'm here, people with whom I'm either personally friendly or whom I, for whom I have a great appreciation. So it's for me not only a place to have a what you, creative interaction, whatever you want with students, but also to have theoretical exchange, debates with my friends and so on. So I think that precisely getting top people, but giving them freedom, not freedom to do nothing, but precisely freedom to work in this creative interspace. Also, the way curriculum, the way talks are done. We do very serious theoretical work here, but not part of any in advance prescribed curriculum. Uh, uh, but really, we just have to put it, follow our inner urge. Like, I like how the school approaches me. It's not, we want you to do a course on 19th and 20th century psychoanalysis. It's what you are really working on now. What really interests you. Give that to students. And which is, of course, very hard on me, but in a positive sense. I like it, you know. Like, I remember, it's the same as I remember only once was I really because I hate teaching, I mean, I hate, here I like it, I hate teaching in this regular university curriculum. Only once in Slovenia to help a friend, I gave a short course, and then I had to, had to, or had to be there for exams with the students. So I thought how to terrorize the students, and I found a way. I report on this in one of my books, in a footnote, I think. I, of course, the best terror is always terror under the mask of its opposite, of democracy. You know? So, I didn't ask them a question. I told them, you ask yourself a question, and then you answer it. Why? Because it makes it democratic. You automatically choose what you know best. Ah, but you know, they didn't have any excuse. They couldn't have said, oh, sorry, you know, I could have answered you. They, they had to be at their best. No excuse. And it's the same here. We cannot say, oh, sorry, Wolfgang forced us to do a course on this, I would prefer to do that. No, we are challenged to do, no excuse. If what you give here is not the best, it's your fault, not university's fault. Again, I think this is very productive, so it's wonderful to see how <clears throat> somebody like Badiou comes and really, it's like work in progress that you can see. For example, Badiou's new philosophical classic, which will probably turn out to be a new classic of contemporary philosophy, his Logic of the Worlds. Okay, now it appeared, but you know, for the last couple of years, students were able here to, to as it were, get an insight into it as a work in progress. The same, for example, with Agamben, not to mention all the artists and so on. So for me, it's this place here, how to put it, strikes the right balance between strict, hard work and comradeship. It is enough of a hard work with professor's authority so that it's really serious work. It's not just that, you know, we are all here about this, we, we, we mix for drinks. But at the same time, it's enough mixing between students and professors as equal so that you can get real productive exchange, not just this rit ritualistic, ritualistic questions, answers, and so on. I think this is what accounts for the growing success of EGS here. It's simply a negative proof of the failure of today's academia. And I think that, and this is a critical remark on today's predominant academia. I don't know how far you know what it goes on around Europe, in European Union today, the so-called Bologna process, mm -hmm. which is really a kind of a technocratic streamlining, redirecting of higher education to make it, as they put it, more responsible, flexible to social needs, which I think is, in the long term, a catastrophe. In what sense? 
<coughs> listen, even in the most positivistic way, if you look at scientific ideas and how they were really efficient, change something in reality, even in pure hard natural sciences, you often find this paradox that, you know, it's not you want something, an invention in this, that, and you put money into it. Usually it was people were researching, doing one domain, and as a kind of a totally accidental byproduct, they discovered something which then could have been applied for a totally different domain. Like, since everybody likes to put blame on military complex, for example. We know that, it's a nice example, that the most popular fundamental phenomenon of communication of the last decades, uh, World Wide Web, Internet, started as a local problem of American uh, militaries. No, the problem was, as we all know, if in the case of the nuclear war, if the headquarters are hit, how to re-establish communication. And through this, it slowly developed. This is a nice example of how, but my point is it goes in both directions. Something dealt with as a totally local problem. What can be more stupid, okay, for the military serious, but for us ordinary people, as how the military groups will communicate in the case of nuclear catastrophe which wipes out the headquarters. This something global emerged. Or the other way around, I think it's even more interesting. And here even the connections are often, I mentioned them in my class, extremely obscene. Like this incredible fact of the popularity, I checked it up, it's not a hoax, it is a story, true. How in Israeli military research, not just abstract research, but even like practice, strategic think thinking, which is then really applied, how in fighting Palestinian intifada, where to avoid a misunderstanding, my sympathies are definitely on the side of intifada, but nonetheless, how they, one of the basic references is Deleuze and Gattari work, especially Thousand Plateau. It's incredible, and I think this is what makes institutions like SASFE so precious. Because Bologna idea is streamlined, like hard sciences or, uh, should more and more rely on connections with business. On the other hand, even human sciences should be rendered more applicable. For example, I know in England, departments of psychology are more and more pushed to make, uh, to make separate private deals with companies. The tendency of the new labor there is even to, to, to make state funding dependent on this. Like they tell departments, if you earn, if you get so many contracts from private companies, then we will match it to that extent with ours. So it's, so even some philosophy departments, I was told, there was a pressure of them to organize some kind of a, what in German they call Schnellkurs or what, no, kind of a weekend courses for top managers, you know, to give them general coordinates, like what does it mean post-modernity, new capitalism, post-industrial, to give them kind of a general outline of what is going on today. I think this is a catastrophe, but a catastrophe in the dialectical sense, that is to say, not only will we lose this general approach, but in the long term, the one who will suffer will be precisely the applicability, the truly productive applicability itself. I mean, are we aware how radically contingent scientific inventions are? For example, uh, how is the idiot? Oh, sorry, Chomsky. You know that his entire transformative grammar emerged out of he said that how in early 50s he was as a student playing games, kind of grammatical games, how you can draw the three line of how a sentence is structured. Out of the, what, for, isn't this a nice irony that for a couple of years he thought he's just, you know, he used this to, to amuse himself, to relax between, as it were, serious linguistic work as a pastime. And then, you know, something that started as a private joke, and then the idea came, my God, why don't we make a theory out of it?